Cardiff winger Lately is going lurch, speech recognition, see how long, should know how well, can determine in about. Background noise. In. Now, if you didn't quite understand what I just said, you're not the only one. That's what happens when you dictate your script into a smartphone. I'll now try it again for your ears. This week, Click looks at the latest speech recognition technology to see how well a computer can determine my words above the background noise. Four decades on and still going strong, we get in touch with the inventor of the mobile phone to celebrate its 40th birthday. We also have the latest tech news from around the world and an in-depth review of Microsoft's new social scene in Webscape. Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly. For decades, science fiction writers and geeks alike have longed for the day when we can interact with our computers in the same way that we do with each other. And things have certainly moved on in recent years. We can now touch the screens on our phones and we can gesture at our games, consoles and TVs. But some parts of the natural world are harder to handle than others. Understanding what we say, for example, is, as science puts it, non-trivial. In the past, speech recognition mostly worked by matching recorded words to audio stored in a database. But now, thanks to faster onboard processors and the almost limitless computational power of the internet, it can go a lot further. Find the nearest restaurant. Apple's Siri, Android's personal assistant, plus the Bing and Google web searches can all take voice requests. Now, each of them actually just record your voice and then upload the audio to the web. What should we do tonight? It's there that it's broken down into individual sounds or phonemes and converted to text, where it can be treated just like any other search query. And it's getting better, although it's still not perfect. I have to say, I am quietly impressed by the quality of the speech-to-text function on high-end smartphones. But the key word there is quiet. In a lovely soundproof radio studio like this, the phone has hardly any problems picking out those phonemes, those individual parts of the words. However, pop outside into what I like to call the real world and the thing will have huge problems working out which bits are me and which bits are everyone else. Background noise is the number one enemy of speech recognition. And here, the mobile phone has a much harder job than, say, Xbox Connect, which lives in one location and can scan its surroundings during setup, work out the acoustics, Xbox. and then listen more effectively. Search. Some phones do use a second rear facing microphone to analyse the background noise and remove it. But why use two when you can use? 32. Hi, it's only me. I was just ringing to tell you that I'm as usual. Patrick Naylor from Imperial College in London is one scientist who thinks that more is more. Hi, this is Patrick. I was just ringing to let you know that I've arrived. With two mics, the software only correctly identifies a few words, the white ones in this text. Hi, this is Patrick. I was just ringing to let you know that... But with 32 mics, all recording sound from different angles, the results improve dramatically. Of course, this will only be practical when the equipment can be shrunk. Just a little. But if a computer is to become more than just a dictation machine, a useful personal assistant, it not only needs to capture what I say, but also understand what I meant. Excuse me, I'm looking for a lift. Sorry, I didn't bring my car today. Some words, for example, have several meanings. Excuse me, I'm looking for a lift. Sure, you're a beautiful person with a wonderful personality. It's important to understand the context of what it's been asked in order to determine which answer is correct. Hmm. Well, this is what they meant. Modern speech recognition apps can access a vast database of language models that change and move with the current trends. They learn from past mistakes and your personal use of language, and they can even guess the next word before you say it. And this is just the first step to learning more about you and what you're likely to ask. 
my location, shopping habits, favourite TV programmes, music choices and my emails and social networks can all give insights into who I am, what I want and what I've said and help a machine to arrive at more meaningful answers. So if, for example, I bought a plane ticket to Rio, the next time I say Rio, the software may guess that I'm talking about the city and not the movie. But if successful speech recognition relies so much on your personal profile, you don't really want to create a new one on every gadget you own. And that's exactly what a company called Nuance is doing. Creating a profile of you that lives in the cloud and which can be accessed anywhere by anything. For example, if I want to check up on my favourite sporting events, how are the Celtics doing? The Celtics are losing. It's 46 to 42, Lakers, with 11.58 left in the third. Now, my profile has told this device that I prefer basketball to football, so it's updating me on the Celtics basketball team and not the Celtic football team. In reality, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Anyway, once you've finished reading about the results of the match, play the Rolling Stones. I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Now, everything that I've just done outside should have been added to my global profile, which means I can just pick up where I left off on this laptop, for example. So, put on the playlist I was listening to. You got it. And up come the Rolling Stones again. Watch the fifth element. Now, here's the really cool thing. If I just pause this movie, I can show you that my profile isn't just accessible on mobile phones and laptops, but on other internet-enabled devices too. For example, that internet TV over there. So I'll use this iPhone as a remote control for the TV and say, play the movie I was watching. And pretty quickly, the fifth element picks up from the same point I left off on this laptop. Do you remember earlier I was supposedly interested in some sport? Well, throw on the game. It knows which game I was talking about because I asked about it earlier. And that's the, um, the New York Red Legs uh, against the, uh, the Boston uh, Tall People. Uh, and they're winning 15 love. Now, a system that knows me better than I know myself is great as long as it doesn't start sharing that information with others. If you can build a profile of the person's voice and the way they use language, you'll definitely get a much better accuracy from speech recognition. It becomes personalized to you. However, <laughs> there's a big but here, and that is that in many cases, you really can't do that because you're building systems which are universally accessible without any knowledge of the user or there are privacy issues associated with grazing on people's personal data to build models which may be unacceptable in some applications. By giving them permission you get the benefits of these, uh, the profile and, uh, and the relevant re listings coming back to you. If you don't then you'll just uh, get a, a blank uh, sort of standard response to it. On the, our server side it's going to be an anonymous ID pertaining to that particular individual and we're going to collect information and allocate it against that, 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 that anonymous ID. So if anybody was able to get that information, they wouldn't know who it belonged to uh, and therefore wouldn't be able to make reuse of that. And if more than one person will be using a device, the system will need to know who's speaking and then switch profiles accordingly. This visualisation, built by AT&T, uses cameras and facial recognition to identify the user who's currently talking. Hello, Ivy. It's one of the ultimate goals of computing. Machines that interact with us on our terms. And although Ivy here is still just a mock-up, we are approaching a time when our computers may become simple yet viable personal assistants. Can you set a reminder in 30 minutes to take this out of the oven? Just make sure you specify which type of jam you'd like for breakfast. Strawberry or traffic? I would recommend leaving 15 to 20 minutes early. Well, it's nice and quiet in here, so hopefully everyone will get the message that next up, it's this week's tech news. 
Facebook is aiming to become the centre of your smartphone experience with a new people-centric app that puts your friend updates and chats at the heart of your handset. Facebook Home pings up any email notifications or calendar alerts from within the app. You can also carry on conversations with your friends while using other apps on your phone. It's being released on April the 12th, both as a download initially for a handful of Android smartphones and integrated into a new mid-range handset from HTC. A company that lets users buy and sell pre-owned digital music has lost a copyright case in the US. ReDigi wants to recreate the trade in second-hand records online and claims to keep things legal by deleting the seller's music file before sending it to the new owner. The courts, though, didn't agree, ruling that as a copy has to be made, it's impossible to transfer digital files in the same way as a physical book or DVD. When is an April Fool's joke not an April Fool's joke? Well, when it turns out to be true. What was initially taken to be a prank, an internet-wide rumour that Chinese online search giant Baidu was working on homegrown Google Glass-style tech specs, was subsequently confirmed. A Baidu spokesperson said the company already had a working prototype, complete with heads-up image search and voice control. Fortunately, not every April Fool's turned out to be true. The President of the United States became a nine-year-old for the day. It looks like you're expecting somebody else. But April Fool's on all y'all. And in a sign that text speak may have gone too far, Twitter announced plans to charge $5 a month for the use of vowels on the social network. Not to be outdone, Google unveiled the new sensation in search. Google knows which adds the ability to search and experience spells in your browser. Hmm, fear not, the project comes with a safe search option. If life begins at 40, then the mobile phone has a lot to look forward to. It is already the powerhouse in our pockets, but it came from humble beginnings, from an engineer at a startup called Motorola who, on April the 3rd, 1973, made the first ever cell phone call publicly to, well, to assembled journalists in Midtown Manhattan. That engineer has entered the tech pantheon as a pioneer, the father of the mobile phone. And he recently divulged his story to Richard Taylor. Marty Cooper, not a name you're likely to be familiar with. His invention, well, billions of us most intimately are. The portable cell phone, embodied first in this handset built by Marty and his team at a nimble startup called Motorola. This two kilo hunk of heft was the culmination of years of work, a philosophical leap of faith away from the prevailing thinking by the industry giant Bell Labs and parent company AT&T, whose vision was simply to put cell phones in cars. For a hundred years, we had been trapped in our homes, leashed to our desk by this copper wire. Now was the time to set us free, and trapping us in our cars was not uh, an improvement. We had to create a dazzling demonstration, and that was the real reason. The real reason for creating this phone was to prove to the world that a little company like Motorola had credibility. Uh, and that's what we did in New York and in Washington. We did a, what turned out to be a dazzling uh, demonstration uh, that the time was ready for personal portable communications. And it was using a phone very similar to this. This is essentially a replica of what you used. That's correct. What did you say on that first mobile phone call? So I called my counterpart uh, at Bell Laboratories, a fellow named uh, Dr. Joel Engel, uh, a very bright guy, and he ran all the AT&T program. Very important and responsible job. Uh, and I told him, Joel, it's Marty, and I'm calling you from a cell phone but a real cell phone, a handheld, personal, portable cell phone. And there was silence at the other end of the line. And I'm That's certain, a bit worrying. Knowing Joel, I'm certain that he was polite, uh, but to this day he doesn't remember that call. 
And I'm not You're sure certain. he was actually there? There was somebody at the other end, was there? Oh, yes. <laughs> there was. Yeah, I'm certain there was. <laughs> and had you given it a lot of thought before you actually made that call, what you were going to say? Was that the kind of Neil Armstrong moment on the ground with mobile no, telephony? It, it was spontaneous, and I, I'm sure that Joel would rather I had not had that spontaneity. How much did you profit personally from your invention? Well, in terms of satisfaction, uh, enormously. Uh, when I uh, joined Motorola, I signed a document uh, that said that all of my future inventions were the property of Motorola, and for that they gave me a dollar. Uh, and uh, it was the best, best bargain that I ever made. <laughs> Motorola treated me very well, and the world has been very nice to me. So here we are 40 years on, with handsets that seem to be capable of launching a spaceship, and yet some of the fundamentals about the mobile phone industry don't seem to have been addressed. Even in the so-called developed world, in the middle of a big metropolis, you get drop calls, you can't get network coverage, even in your own house, which may be you know, a few miles outside of a, of, of a big city. Has the industry got it all wrong? Oh, I think so. They're, they have not attacked the fundamentals. Uh, even today, most people around the world, and, and you know that uh, well over five billion people have cell phones today. That's, wow. I mean, most That's of the people of the world on population. Earth, That's and most of them still talk, and the ones that don't still text. Right. Uh, and yet the emphasis uh, of the carriers uh, has been to market speed. Uh, and, and yet the technology exists today, and it's being adopted slowly, but more slowly than uh, you and I would prefer, uh, that would give us really solid coverage and increase the capacity of a system. When you in London get a dropped call, it's because somehow in the cell that you're in, you have run out of capacity. And yet the technology exists to fix that problem. So we've talked a little bit about features of handsets and, and networks. Where do you see handsets and mobile phones taking us next? There are so many things that can be accomplished when a human being is connected to the rest of the world. But the one that's most exciting to me is the medical revolution. Because now we have the capability of measuring things on your body, of actually doing a physical examination every 30 seconds instead of every year, or in my case, every five years, and actually understand what diseases are starting to form in your body before they become diseases. That would be incredible. People will remain healthy for most of their lives. It's going to take a generation or two, but that's going to happen. But it's started already, and I want to show you some examples. One of the biggest causes of death in, the, in Western civilization is congestive heart failure. Uh, and yet, we know how to anticipate that. Congestive heart failure means you're accumulating fluid in your lungs. Here's a patch that a person can wear on their body, may have to change it on every week or so. This patch talks to your cell phone and it senses what the fluid level in your lungs is. So the cell phone sends the data off somewhere. And that it? information goes somewhere and you get an alert maybe six hours before you would have had a heart attack. You pop a pill and you avoid it. Just extrapolate that to a whole bunch of other diseases. And then you have some more frivolous things, you know, like this patch, which does the same thing. It talks to your cell phone, but it measures your caloric intake and output. And so if you're on a calorie-controlled diet, that's incredibly useful. Well, just suppose you're sitting there at dinner and someone serves a dessert and your computer <laughs> says, ah, 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 you've already exceeded your capacity. Don't eat that. Yeah, not sure it would stop me, but anyway. Yeah. Marty Cooper, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. Marty Cooper talking to Richard Taylor. Now, a couple of months ago, we told you about Microsoft's attempts to join the friendly crowd with the launch of its new connections platform, Social. But does the world need yet another way to connect online? Well, we asked Kate Russell to find out, and here's her full review of Social in Webscape. So, another one of the big tech companies wants a piece of the social pie. And with Microsoft's long pedigree, you'd think they've learned a thing or two about how to please us. But when I fired up social for the first time, it felt more like they'd mashed together some of the best bits of what everyone else is doing, rather than coming up with anything new. Design-wise, it looks like the love child of Pinterest and Windows 8. 
with users creating posts on a topic and then using the integrated Bing search tool to fill it with tiles from news, pictures, videos and web streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got a friend. This site looks very pretty, but I have to say I think Microsoft have completely missed the mark when it comes to delivering a social network. We want to share the things we want to share when we come across them. Links, thoughts, ideas, and yes, sometimes what we had for breakfast. This reverse posting where you have to think of a topic and then try and fill it with content using what is actually quite a basic search tool seems clunky and awkward. There's the usual social features like following, commenting and sharing, but no private interactions or curated groups like Google Circles, although you can check out posts sorted by interests. The last section is parties, where you can video chat and watch videos together with a group of people in real time. Uh, Google Hangouts, anyone? Launched in beta last December, I can see this having about as much long-term appeal as Google Wave. Remember that? Hmm, my point exactly. You've got a friend. For a totally different social experience, check out this massively multiplayer online environment, Rump Patrol where the only objective is to swim around looking for people to chat to. Can't swim, so I took a boat to an island so remote. It's worth noting that most chat environments like this are unmoderated and not everybody plays nicely. This site doesn't give you the option to report other players for bad behaviour. So if someone is bothering you, just swim away from them or close the site and come back later. And children should definitely be supervised. You can log in with Twitter if you want an at name, but I didn't much like the look of those authorizations. Or name your little wriggler whatever you like by typing name, colon, etc. It was built by some Norwegian developers to test what they could do with the latest web programming language HTML5, and the name means tadpole in Norwegian. Well, I play for keeps, baby. A couple of weeks ago, Google launched Keep, a note-taking app free on Android 4.0 and above. You can record voice-to-text notes, make chicken stew for dinner, snap a photo to add context, and it all syncs up to your Google Drive with colour coding to organise categories. The service is very basic right now. You can't even clip bits of web pages, so unlikely to make the likes of Evernote and SpringPad sweat much in terms of competition. But who knows what features might be added in the future. I realise I just heavily criticised Microsoft for doing nothing new, and this offering from Google is also a poor imitation of its peers, but at least it's useful. And if you don't already use a note taker, you'll probably quite like it. Even though it does look suspiciously like a Windows phone interface. She's just a girl and she's on fire. And give Firefox a facelift with a nice update to version 20, serving up private browsing by tab, very handy for checking multiple email addresses, an improved download manager, and the ability to close hanging plugins without shutting the entire browser. This girl is on fire! Kate Russell's Webscape. And those links are all available at our website if you missed them, bbc.co.uk slash click. And if you'd like to get in touch about anything you've seen today, you can drop us an email, click at bbc.co.uk. You can also get hold of us on many different social networks, Google+, Facebook and Twitter, to name but three. That's it for now, though. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next time.